You've got GCSE Physics Paper 1 tomorrow and this video is going to be the reason that you get a grade 9 because we are going to go through some of the key question areas that are mo more than likely to come up tomorrow based on what's come up in the past, what hasn't been tested so frequently. I'm going to be giving you some questions that I genuinely think are going to be coming up, some specific topic areas that you should really be looking at over these last couple of hours. We're going to go through how you should be answering the different styles of question in the exam itself to make sure you're prepared for all eventualities, you know how to maximise your marks, as well as some final tidbits that you can be thinking of to maximise your revision time this evening and tomorrow morning to make sure that you enter that in, into that exam being able to answer every question to the best of your ability and get the best mark possible. First of all, what are we looking at? We're looking at energy, electricity, the particle model of matter and atomic structure. Those are the four topic areas that are going to be coming up in this paper. Now for each of these topic areas, I've basically gone through the four most recent past papers for AQA, OCR and Edexcel as well as their, some of their examiners' reports based on, you know, some of the most recent papers, to take a look at what has and hasn't been assessed. Now, what do I think is more than likely to come up? Well, let's start with energy. Now, the application of the conservation of momentum comes up all the time. The conservation of energy or the conservation of momentum, both of them, they, they come up a lot. Think like bungee jump scenarios or, or like a pendulum being able to explain what is going on in terms of energy stores and in terms of momentum, that is super, super important. So it's things like gravitational potential energy from bungee jumper, and you know, you've got them falling, you've got them falling, and then you've got the elastic energy of the spring as they sort of like go down below the length of the spring. The spring ex extends, I suppose it's a rope more than a spring, but you can model it as a spring, of course. Those sorts of questions you should really be familiar with. There is an explicit word for word mark scheme across all the exam boards that you basically just need to memorise and that will mean that you get full marks on those questions every single time you attempt them. As well as that, we've also got graphing interpretation for the heating curves. That comes up very, it used to come up a lot and then they didn't test it for a while. So that makes me think it's more than likely to come up this time as well. So take a look at your heating curves. We've gone to electricity. Um, some very key ideas are obviously knowing resistance, um, series and parallel circuits, but in particular, understanding why increasing the number of resistors in a parallel circuit actually lowers the resistance because that is not intuitive. In physics, examiners like to differentiate between students who are going to get a seven and students who are going to get an eight or a nine by including these questions that are just not intuitive. The answer to this isn't an intuitive one, but if you are able to answer it, then that separates you. That puts you out there as a grade nine student as opposed to a grade seven student, for example. So understanding these slightly more complex topic areas. And like I say, these are little things that you can Google this evening, write down on a cheat sheet, look over just before you get into the exam and you're going to be able to get full marks on these questions because, again, this has a predefined set mark scheme, set answer that you can learn and repeat in the exam. Uh, as well as that, comparing current and voltage in series and parallel circuits can be really useful. Make sure, please make sure that you know the diagrams, that you understand what the symbols are for all the different circuit components and that you're going to be able to both draw and interpret circuit diagrams. So you can kind of look at it and understand, okay, what is this circuit actually doing? If you struggle with that, my biggest recommendation is to look for videos, to look for animations that will sort of animate the way that charges are flowing around the circuit, what is happening, where the current is splitting, if it's parallel circuit, those sorts of things. Find these animations, they are everywhere, even free science lessons have some. Moving on to the particle model of matter, the, there are some really interesting longer sort of multi-step calculations which go through the energy needed to melt and then heat a substance, so we're using both Q equals ML and Q equals MC change in T. If you can get to grips with those calculation questions, that, those are the hardest calculation questions that you're likely to encounter. The best place that I think to find these is physics and maths tutor because they have question packs that are purely these calculations. I would advise you to go through two or three, understand the method, even if you're not getting the, the correct answer. With these sorts of questions, there is an explicit what you are going to be rewarded for. And as long as you know the first couple of steps, you can get three to four marks out of six on those questions. If you're not using the exact methodology they want you to use, unless you get the correct answer, you won't be getting method marks. So I would advise you to, even if you think you're still going to be getting them wrong, that's so fine, but know the method so that you can at least pick up some method marks. Um, and similarly, understanding the link between temperature and pressure, particularly for gases, that's going to be really quite useful. I think that is something that is more than likely to come up. And we're going to move on to our final topic, which is atomic structure. And obviously calculating the activity after a certain number of half-lives, that comes up a lot. But being able to do that from a graph, so reading graphs, and then danger and uses of radiation in medicine or industry, that has not come up 
across the exam boards very recently and has not been examined in any sort of depth. So I would make sure that you do know that because a lot of students will gloss over the application parts of physics, but they love to test application bits of physics because it's taking the theory and forcing you to think about, okay, so how is this used in the real world? And they love to test you on that. So really do try. Those are some of the topic areas I really do think are going to be coming up. I'm now going to move on to taking you through how to be answering the different styles of question. So there are a fair few different kinds of question that you're going to get in your physics exam. The first of which are going to be those one or two markers. Some of these are going to be multiple choice questions. If it's a multiple choice question, um, a lot of the time they're going to be very easy. They're not there to trick you out most of the time. And there will be an answer. You will see that it's correct. If you think it's correct, mark it, make sure you read all of them. Never read the first one, go, oh, that's correct. And don't read the back. No, read all of them. But if there's one that stands out to you as, okay, that is a correct answer. Choose it, move on. Even if you get it wrong, it's one mark, that's so fine, you'd rather use your time on something else. If you're struggling, are there any that you can rule out? Can you say, okay, this one is definitely not right? Great, because you will have narrowed down your you know, chance of getting it right from one in four to one in three. And if you are really struggling and you've been working on it for like over two minutes, pick one, move on, it's one mark. For two mark questions, make sure you're, generally these are going to be explaining a certain concept. You're using keywords, Keywords are so important. In physics, you can't explain without using the keyword. You've got to use it because they won't credit you otherwise. And also make sure you know your spellings because they are very picky. If you spell something slightly wrong, it means it might look ever so slightly like something else, they won't credit you. So use your keywords, know your spellings for those keywords and make sure you're doing really focused answers because if it's one or two marks, waffle is not going to help. Actually, waffle can hinder you because if in waffling, you say something that's actually incorrect, then you will get marked down for it being incorrect. So in British exams, there's very rarely going to be negative marking like that, but they do apply it in these physics papers. So make sure you're not doing that. Okay, and then the second type of question that you're going to get are those three to four mark questions. And the keywords they usually use for these are explain or describe. And when you see those sorts of keywords, you know you're not looking for evaluation. You're not looking for any sort of elaborate application, unless obviously you're describing an application. What you are looking for is good use of keywords and a step-by-step -step process. Generally, these are going to be questions where you're responding with words like, and then, therefore, subsequently, consequently. It's basically showing that you understand the process, not just the outcome. So you're trying to link the cause to the effect. And that is a great structure to use, particularly if it's a full mark and it's one of those pick two. One mark is for the cause and the other mark is for the effect. And that is really quite useful. But similarly, you might get things like explain why current increases as resistance decreases. And that is four points. You should be saying one thing, therefore something else, and then something else, and finally something else. So do you see how you're creating that chain of analysis? And you've probably only heard about these chains of, chains of reasoning, really. You've probably only heard about them in subjects like English or economics, but actually they're very applicable to physics in these style of um, answering questions. You'll also get five to six markers, and these are either going to be maths-based questions, in which case all of your working out, make sure you practice them, make sure you know your equations, I'll be listing off the ones that you do need to know later on, and just generally applying best practices, checking your units because they love to trip you up with units. Always read the units in the question and always use the, read the units that they want you to write your answer in. Make sure you're aware of them. The second type that you might get is longer application questions. So it's a longer explanation. You're adding in some more detail. You're making sure that you're trying to explain every single step in the process. Even if you think something is really obvious, add it in there anyway. And the third type that you will get are the practical questions. Now, if you get a practical question, there is a very clear checklist. Method, equipment, variables, and accuracy. That is what you need to be mentioning. So what are you going to do? How are you going to do it? Like, what are you going to use? What are the control variables? What's the independent variable? What's the dependent variable? And then talk about the accuracy. Are there ways of improving accuracy? Is it a reliable test experiment, I mean? Uh, sorry, I'm in like statistics mode at the moment rather than physics mode. But those are the things that you want to be thinking about and that's how you get the marks on any sort of an application style question. Now you'll also often get graphical questions. For these, what they want you to do is they want you to be in explaining but also interpreting the graph. So yes, you can talk about the shape of the graph, but then in order to get the subsequent marks, you've got to explain what that actually means in physics terms. 
So if you're looking at the graph for, for example, a filament bulb, the, the IV characteristics of a filament bulb, yes, you want to talk about the S shape of it, but what does that actually mean? What is actually happening? You know, why is there be heat being produced in that bit of filament? You've got to be a lot more specific and get to the physics side of things because you can only get a minority of the marks by describing the graph, as it were, unless that is the sole purpose of the question. But even then, you just want to link it slightly to those physics concepts because that is what's going to get you those marks. And obviously, describe the shape, describe the trend that you see. Is it positive? Is it negative? Is it strong? Is it weak? Um, and is there any, do you, know, do you need to find the gradient? If you need to find the gradient, are you drawing a tangent to the curve or are you using two points? Understand what it wants you to do. So what do I want you to do the night before this exam? First of all, if when I was listing off a bunch of these topics that I think are more than likely to come up, you're, you were sat there going, oh my goodness, I have not revised this certain topic area as much as I should have done. That is what you're going to start your revision focused on. But the way that I want you to do that is if you really think you have a content gap, okay, fair enough, go watch some videos, go watch free science lessons, cognito, something like that. But generally, I just want you to focus on questions because that is where you're going to pick up how the mark scheme wants you to answer the questions. And with a subject like physics, they reuse the same questions year after year after year and just ever so slightly change the context or the numbers. Once you've done all the past papers, you will realize this. It is repetitive. And that's why those predictions are predictions that I have made. And that is why doing questions is going to be the most beneficial thing that you can do this evening in order to prepare you for this exam. Make sure you also do review the equations. So I do have the list. What equations do you actually want? You want energy, energy transferred is charge multiplied by voltage. You want power is energy over time. You want power in a circuit, current squared multiplied by resistance. Then you want Ohm's law V equals IR. You want energy equals mass times specific heat capacity times change in temperature. You want density, mass divided by volume. You want the thermal energy, which is mass times latent heat. And you want Boyle's law for gases. Sometimes that is normally just in triple, I think, which is PV is equal to constant. Those are the equations you want. Look over them the night before. That is just going to help you put them down in a little sheet, write them down neatly so that you can take that sheet with you to the exam and look over them right before the exam. If you're the kind of person who is going to get it and then go, oh my God, I cannot remember a single one of those equations. What I want you to do is I want it to be the last thing you look at before you walk into the exam and I want you to be really focused on trying to memorize it. When you get into the exam, sit there and have those equations going through your head. And as soon as you're allowed to pick up your pen and okay, once you're allowed to open the paper itself, write them all down. Write them all down on the inside of the first page. And then they're there and you can refer to them if you need them. That can be mightily, mightily beneficial. As well as this, please, please, please know your units. Know what units all of your different things in, as in energy measured in joules, charge measured in cooler. Like know those units because sometimes you're not prompted to use them in a question, but they require you to be used in an answer. And if you don't know them, that is an easy mark that you're losing out on. If you do know them, that's an easy mark that you're picking up on. And I do want to circle back and go back to these six markers because there is a very predefined structure that you can be using, particularly if it's like an explainy thing, because a lot of students find it really hard. They understand what they're doing. They understand the concept, but they don't explain it in a way that allows them to pick up all of those marks. So how should you be structuring it? Well, the first thing you want to think of is defining the key process or the concept. Just literally, whatever the word is, is, and then give its definition. That is the first step. The second step is applying it to the situation in the question. And then you're linking the cause and effect. So you're, you're talking about the situation in the question and then you're saying, okay, what happens? Why? Oh, it's because, moving on to that, including your units, including your formulae and always writing full sentences. Unless you're completely running out of time, in which case do bullet points, but full sentences will get you more marks than bullet points all of the time. So even if you don't like physics, even if you're dreading this exam, using those tips, you're going to be able to get the best grades possible. I really hope it's helped. As ever, let me know in the comments whether you have any questions. I'll be answering a lot of them this evening. See you in the next video.